This is my interview with Jonathan Ackley, recorded for my documentary The Making of Day of the Tentacle for this year's 30th anniversary. Jonathan was programmer on Day of the Tentacle, then went on to work on Sam and Max, Full Throttle, The Dig, and was co-lead on The Curse of Monkey Island with Larry Ahern. Since leaving LucasArts, he's worked for LEGO and for Disney, creating interactive attractions again with Larry Ahern. He's also an inventor and has written a book, Off by One Serious Games, which blends 90s game design with a spy thriller. I have a copy here and I'll be getting stuck in as soon as I'm done editing these interviews. There are links below to Jonathan's socials, Amazon links for buying his book, and links to the full playlist of interviews and the full documentary. As always, I've edited out some pleasantries at the start, so we'll jump right in. Enjoy. Um, so I guess g- going right back, um, how did you kind of start in getting interested in programming and how did you start to come to work? At, uh, how did you actually start working at LucasArts? Do you remember, was there the interview process or anything like that? Uh, well, I had been working at Industrial Light and Magic as a, uh, as a, Gosh, I I even forget the title, but essentially it was a glorified tape technician. So we were in the digital department, which was kind of a new thing in that there were digital files instead of like models and film. And so they had to generate hundreds and thousands of files and they couldn't store it all because hard drives weren't that big. So I had, uh, I, I put things on exabyte tapes, which were little high eight tapes same as you'd put in your camcorder. And uh, so I did that for about a year. And, and uh, uh, in between projects, they didn't have enough work. So I was laid off. And uh, I started, uh, so that was good because then I had time to get a girlfriend. Uh, and I started calling her at work and she worked at, um, at Lucas Learning, which was up on the ranch. And she was doing ed- an educational prototype. And so I had a lot of time and I would keep calling her and I called her so much it bothered her boss so much that she said, well, if he's got nothing better to do than call you, bring him up here and, you know, I'll give him something to do. And uh, so they were doing their prototype in, um, in the scum engine um, and they didn't have enough programmers for it. So even though I wasn't hired to do the programming, all of a sudden, they had need and I wound up programming a large majority of the project. And so when that version of Lucas learning was winding down, both my, you know, now my wife, Casey and I um, were immediately hired into uh, uh, Lucas arts because I was already trained on the programming system and, and Casey's just kind of talented in general as a producer. So she went on and, wound up producing Rebel Assault and I wound up and was uh, programming Day of the Tentacle. So that was your, that was your first project Day of the Tentacle coming in, was it? It was, yeah. And I I came in, the project had already begun and one of the uh, programmers uh, was going on maternity leave. So they needed somebody to backfill when she was out. And so I came in and, uh, immediately started programming so there wasn't even really much of an interview process it was just well he knows what he's doing and we need programmers on day of the tentacle okay <clears throat> so was so was that still based at, at, at skywalker ranch when you when you were working on day of the tentacle no we were down in uh, in kerner down uh in central san rafael right yeah because i thought after the very early 90s that they'd moved away from kind of doing the games there um so also what was the working environment like at the time um at at LucasArts uh well really really focused um you know a bunch of talented young people all focused on just making games um you know we were it was a DOS game so if you ever wrote a bug, you had to reboot the machine, which would take, you know, five to 10 minutes. When I started at LucasArts, I had the fastest computer in the building, which was a 4666. 
And, uh, you know, I was feeling that was pretty sweet. Um, it, you know, it only took a couple hours to recompile the whole game. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. So were you, a, were you a, a fan of games or, you know, adventure games in particular at the time? I was a fan of games. Uh, I had programmed many, 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 many games in basic for my Atari. Started with the 400, went to the 1200 XL. And I thought I would never be a games programmer because nobody ever wanted to play the games that I wrote on my Atari. And uh, it was only later that I realized no one wanted to play those games because they were written in basic and I was trying to write action games for them. So, so consequently I thought, well, I'm never gonna be a professional games programmer because nobody ever wants to play my games. So I guess I'll get a degree in film production, which is what I did. And then somehow circuitously film degree, ILM, Lucas Learning, Lucas Arts, and now I was making story-based uh, adventure games. And I realized my problem was that basic was just really, really slow. Yes, I remember a lot of games from the old, uh, we had a computer here called the BBC Micro, which is like a big push by the BBC to get computers in schools. And that was all, all the games were written on basic. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, so I guess what my, my next question was going to be what hardware you, but you were using, but you said you were using 486, uh, 66. Um, 5.0. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, so, as you said, uh, Data Tentacle written on uh, the Scum engine. Can you tell us a bit about like the tools that come with Scum, um, and do they make programming easier? Or, uh, well, I always liked them, um, except when they crashed, which was often. Um, you know, they'd sort of evolved from tools written for the Commodore sixty four. And um, there were certain tools, um, which fortunately after Day of the Tentacle were, were pretty much jettisoned. But I believe there was an animation tool called Bile. And boy, you had to save all the time because you never knew when it would just decide to lock up your machine. Because again, it was DOS. So if it crashed, reboot. Um, I mean, they were purpose built for making adventure games. And so they were very specialized. They were very good at that. Um, Ron, Eric Willander, Brad Taylor, um, Vince Lee, all tremendous engineers, um, really focused on making adv adventure games work on really, really limited platforms. Um, so like I believe at the time we were doing Day of the Tentacle, the quote, what we called the heap size for a scum game, which was basically um, how much game memory could be allocated out of what your DOS was. We could only keep like 126K in memory at any given time. And then, you know, you'd have these rooms which were three or four panels long and you would try and crush it down to make it fit within this tiny memory footprint. So the tools were really, really, um, really focused on making things work on limited hardware. And then uh, as we went along and I worked, uh, you know, from Day of the Tentacle, I went to Sam and Max Hit the Road, which was like full screen. Uh, and from Sam and Max to full throttle, and from full throttle to the dig and from dig to curse of monkey island i will just say that it just got easier and easier um to make the games um largely because the tools were all focused on making things work on really limited platforms so then as games evolved and the platforms got better we had this highly efficient system that could make even better use of all the resources you had when we were you know in the windows 95 world so um they were, you know, they were really excellent tools. I would say they were not designed to be sold commercially. So the user interfaces were, 
you know, things where the engineer was like, I need to put in this feature and everybody's asking me for it. So I'm going to throw it in. It works. Moving on to the next thing. So I, I would say they're not, they're not super polished, um, but they, they got the job done and they were better than anything else that was available at that time. So did you have any, any, any tricks that you'd use to kind of combat that, that limit in, in, the, in the terms of memory? Uh, yes, we would do horrible things. And when you talk to Larry Ahern, um, he will no doubt, um, you know, be cursing my name. So one of the tools we had was a tool called DK, which was spelled DK, not D-E-C-A-Y, but it essentially did the same thing. So we used a graphics format, and I'm going to get super wonky and boring here. We used a graphics format called LBM. And the LBM format did run length encoding, meaning it wouldn't necessarily just save data for every individual pixel. It would say, I have a red pixel, and the next five pixels are red pixels. So I'm just going to say, that's one plus the number five. <laughs> So if your screen's all red, it's a tiny little file. Um, and that's great. Uh, so what DK would do is it would take a beautiful, pristine work of art and smear it so that it created streaks of color. So we had this nicely thing and the artist had drawn it really detailed. And, it, and then we would, yeah, it doesn't fit. I'm going to hit it with DK, let's say five. And it would smear it just a little bit. Like, does it fit now? Yeah, nope, nope, got to make it uglier. Smear it a little bit more. And then you'd go in and you'd touch up the parts that needed detail. And, and you just keep doing that, making it slightly uglier and uglier until you could finally get it to fit within the tiny memory footprint. Wow. So I know there are early games like um, Zach McCracken, Mark Ferrari kind of just did, it was just solid lines because of that exact reason that uh -huh. it's just reading like one bit of data. Um, yeah. And then he started doing the dithering, which obviously was a lot more memory. So that's interesting, that, that DK. So yeah, I, I bet the artists loved that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or... Uh... Or, or we would just leave out things that the artists did. So Larry Ahern, who was my partner on Curse of Monkey Island, but Larry was lead animator on Day of the Tentacle. And so we had one room that was always problematic. When you go downstairs and there are the chronogons and then it's like a, a, a three panel room and it was huge and a ton of stuff went in there and a bunch of object states and a whole bunch of animations. And towards the end of the project, Larry comes and he's like, I have this animation of the sludge omatic. And when you throw the switch, the sludge omatic is going to do this amazing animation of squash and stretch machine that's making the sludge. And it's, it looks incredible. He must have spent a ton of time on it. And it just couldn't, it, there was no way it was ever going to fit into the room. And so I took one, one frame of it and I just animated nasty little square bubbles floating from the bottom to the top and popping at the top. So it went from this professionally animated, gorgeous, dramatic thing to little programmer art of squares rising to the top and popping. It's always made him very sad, which makes me kind of happy. Wonder if he still has the original animation. That'd be interesting to see. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. They were all on, you know, three and a quarter floppy disks, and I, I doubt they've survived 30 years. Mm -hmm. Because we used to back everything up on a, a program called Fastback, and I'm not sure anybody even has that program anymore. It would allow you to back up data across, you know, just a whole bunch of floppy disks. Right. So. So in terms of programming, are you, what were you doing? Like program, programming, like the puzzles that like they come in and say, you know, we've got this puzzle, da, 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 you know, how does, how, and how does it exactly work? Like the timeline of someone saying this is, 
the idea of the scene and where does the art come in? Where does the programming come in? If that makes sense. Let's see. Well, I mean, I know how it happened on later projects uh, coming in, not quite in the middle of the day of the tentacle, but not at the beginning either. But basically you'd get a design document, which was largely just text in outline format. And you'd read through it and you'd wire up the rooms. So generally you could just walk from every room to every room with no puzzles in between. And then you would just start putting in the puzzles with programmer art um, and try and just get the logic tree to work. Um, and then final art would start coming in. And then you would realize that the approach you had taken was totally inappropriate for the art you were receiving. And then you would rewrite the entire thing. And, and you would get different types of art at different times. So, you know, the background art tended to come in earlier than the animation. And oftentimes the animation required the background art to be completed before they would, uh, before they could do anything with it. And uh, so it would kind of slowly evolve from a black and white sketchy game to a black and white sketchy game with a few colored spots in it. And then it would be a mostly colorful game with a few black and white spots in it. And eventually it would just evolve until um, it was finally um, its own thing and you know, a, a fully colorized game. And then you would start getting more and more special case animations and it would get more and more active. Um, but largely it was just kind of like, well, here's the, here's the design document. You go off and write it. And then when I started, um, Tim and Dave wanted to write all of the interactive dialogues of the characters talking to each other, which made sense. You know, they were much more experienced and had done a bunch of games before. So, they wanted to make sure that the complex character dialogues were were done by them. But being the uh, annoying and ambitious young programmer I was, I really wanted to write. And I noticed that unlike uh, um, most of the games before Day of the Tentacle, these backgrounds had a ton of detail to them. And so I'm like, well, I'm just going to start writing funny examine lines for every object I can write. And so. Um, like if Peter Chan drew it, I was going to put a box around it and have the characters say something dumb or funny or stupid when you looked at it. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, I think, and, and then the other programmers are like, well, Jonathan looks like he's having fun. I guess we'll start doing that too. And I think it was us kind of jumping in and adding dumb little jokes throughout the entire thing. It makes the the game feel like it has more going on than maybe some of the previous games. You know, a lot of the games, the only objects you could touch were those which had a puzzle related to them. And uh, so Day of the Tentacle to me just feels really full, you know, full of jokes and full of funny stuff. Mm, agreed. And there's a lot of cool little stuff in the background as well, like, you know, Stormtrooper helmet and Darth Vader calendar and all sorts and, you know, I know yeah. Peter put put like little references to his family in the background and stuff, didn't he as well? So yeah, he's he's a genius. He's just a fantastic artist, and yeah, and a lot of subtle humor from from Peter. So how how would Tim and Dave as um, as leads on the project? Uh, well, they were great. I mean, I I think Dave the Tentacle is is. If I were, you know, going to point somebody to say, I need to learn how to do puzzle design, I would point them to Day of the Tentacle because the puzzles are just a clinic. Um, Tim was mostly focused on writing the dialogue, so the the person who was generally, you know, managing the unruly programmers was Dave, um, but they were both great um, and uh, and and very 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 funny. Um, uh, and they tended to be uh, hands-off uh, unless 
they found something that you, that you had programmed or written in that you didn't like, in which case it would come back from the next merge and it would just be gone. You're like, okay, I guess they didn't like that one. Um, but uh, uh, just fantastic, fantastic guys. Um, and, uh, and, and pretty inspirational. I think it was only possible for us to contribute the way that we did because the game design was so solid. Right. We didn't have to go to them every five minutes and say, what did you mean by this? It was just all very, very clear. Um, which is saying something, considering how convoluted the puzzle tree is on Day of the Tentacle. Um, so, you know, their ability to both do the design and then communicate the design is, is really, um, really amazing. So I learned a ton both of how to program and how to design games from Tim and Dave. I know they were big on, um, what, what do they call them, pizza orgies, which is basically just, you know, getting feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so would you kind of observe people playing the game while you were, while you were making it? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out whether I was on the project when they did the pizza orgy for Day of the Tentacle. And I don't remember. I may have been, but I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Generally, what you look for when you do the pizza orgy is you're bringing in a ton of people who don't know anything about the game, and you're just looking for where they're confused. Um, I know some game companies, particularly with puzzle games, are like really happy when you're confused. Um, but but we were not. Like it, it, the challenge should not be trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. The challenge should be figuring out how to do the thing that you know what you're supposed to do. And so a lot of the pizza orgy was people just saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Nobody's told me, I haven't received any hints. And you would write that down. It's like, oh, I need to write some hints um, because we don't want them saying, I don't know, I don't care anymore because you haven't told me why I should try and open that door. <clears throat> uh, and also it was just kind of a fun thing for everybody to get together and, mm -hmm. and do. Did you have a favorite um, like scene or puzzle from Day of the Tentacle? Oh, let's see. I can tell you one scene I did not like was the chattering teeth on the floor. Because um, the logic of that chattering teeth was such that it was usually quite easy that you could get the chattering teeth to a position where they would get stuck and could not get grabbed. Um, but that's not really a problem with the puzzle. That's really a problem with how difficult that was to program and how new I was at the scum system trying to get that to work. I think Dave in the end wound up programming that. Um, favorite puzzle? I don't know, anything that, that involved the time traveling, like putting the wine in the, in the time capsule so that you can get vinegar in the future. Um, just all of that, um, starting in the past, like, you know, cutting down the tree so it's not there to, to bug you in the future. <clears throat> just really great stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think that's part of the main appeal of just the story is that whole, you know, the three timelines, incredible. Like, I've, I've always wondered, like, it's a very American version of history, though, right? You're dealing with America's founding fathers. Like, does that translate over the seas? It, it does. Uh, like, I mean, we, we don't learn anything in school, but like, we're conceptually aware of that stuff more so than probably um, Americans would be aware of, say, certain things in the UK's history. Um, but we we know who like George Washington and the founding fathers and all that jazz are, and like you know the the um, the Constitution and da da da. We yeah we know all all of that, um, and I think it's you know it's a loose um, <laughs> interpretation of that history, isn't it? So no, it it, it's, it all happened exactly <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. So I mean, it, I mean, I was like twelve when it came out, and it it was. I, I kind of knew who the characters were more or less. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's interesting though. I wonder how you know because I know they're hu- Lucas Arts games huge in Europe, like places like Germany, and I wonder how how that kind of came across over there. But I don't know. Yeah. So um, yeah, like you said, David Zenkel, you met Samamax, uh, the dig and full throttle. So obviously you uh, were lead on um, Curse after that, but was, mm-hmm. so were you doing a similar role on those games leading up to that? Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Although on uh, Seven Max, I largely was focused on sound effects for that game. Oh, okay. So the hideous cracking sound you get when you smash the rat in Whacker Rat, that's probably my proudest moment from that game. Nice. Actually, just whack around is my favorite part of that game. <clears throat> so, did did you do any sound effects on uh, Dead Tentacle then? I did. You know, it's interesting though because I was looking back at the I, I was looking at the intro and it said digital editing by Ron Baldwin, and Ron was one of the programmers on the project. And uh, but I remember doing a lot of the sound editing for that. I certainly did all of the sound effects programming for that. Um, meaning that took the sound files and, um, and, and put them through the whole thing um, to try and make it sound like a Warner Brothers cartoon. And uh, yeah, so I, I programmed all the sound effects and it was very interesting because the game felt very different. Um, like I think sound actually, uh, music came probably close to last. And so you feel the game evolve and, and like it goes to color to, from black and white to color. It's like, oh, the game feels a little bit different, but it still doesn't really feel alive. But boy, when those sound effects start dropping in, all of a sudden sound is, it makes such a huge um, effect of it. Uh, and it really transformed the game and all of a sudden the game felt completely different. And when you play the game, there are a ton of different sound effects for just picking up objects. Whip, woo. Um, and so at the beginning of the game, the game feels a lot more lively. Towards the end of the game, you've picked up everything. And so you, there are just many fewer sound effects. And so I just find that playing the technical as it gets towards the end, it just doesn't feel as, um, you know, it, it just has less sound and therefore kind of feels more subdued than it did at the beginning of the game. Um, this is kind of something I noticed about the game once the sound effects went in. Hmm. Interesting. I do think that, I mean, coming from stuff like Monkey Island, Monkey Island 2, they are technical is so cartoony the the animations and the and the, the graphics but i i think that i know the aim was to kind of emulate um looney tunes and it it, it nailed it and like you say the this the sound effects is just it takes it up at another level i think doesn't it um it's like playing it is like playing a cartoon or it certainly was back then yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't think the previous games had digital sound effects. You know, they had MIDI or Roland or whatever. Um, but honestly, I hadn't played those games. So for me, I was like, well, I'm, I'm sure all games have digital sound effects like this. And, um, and I also didn't recognize how bad the quality of the sound was because it was all... 8 bit 11k something like that it was just mushy and, and horrible but we thought it was amazing and um but there were different versions we had the really terrible version of the quality for the floppy disk game which had limited voice uh but then there was this marvelous new technology called cd rom and boy the audio was so much better on that version um, and a lot more of it. So I think we had different bit rates for the CD-ROM version. The audio did not sound just as nasty as it did on those floppy versions. Because mm, I think the floppy only had the voices in the intro. That was it. Mm-hmm. So did you uh, 
was that any programming for you doing the voices like the uh you know the syncing that up or anything or is that uh well what you do is you write the dialogue in what what in scum would be called a saline be like saline bernard i don't want to pick that up and then when the script was locked um i think eric wrote a system which went and replaced every saline with a macro and that macro would look for the audio file appropriately named uh, for the dialogue that had been written. And so when it came time to record the script, the actors would get the script and the script would have a file name next to the line they were saying. So then when it was recorded, they would immediately save it to the correctly named file. And so all we had to do is once we got the dialogue files is we dumped it into a big folder and ran the game and hoped that the files had been named correctly. Most of the time they were, but other times it's like, yeah, there's no, missed the file name for, you know, Bernard Saline 0240 or whatever it was, and you'd have to dig for it. Um, you might have to reprogram for timing purposes. You know, it's like when it was text, I didn't have to worry about it, but he talks too long or he talked too slowly and now this animation happens at the wrong time. So um, you would have to go in and retime some of your scenes to make them work. So, um, so curse, moving on to curse. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to say, was it like, a, was it, intimidating taking on like such an established franchise and also i just want to add to that because you said you hadn't played them did you presumably play that the first two prior to make to making curse uh yes yeah yeah and uh, uh secret of monkey island was was my favorite adventure game even even after day of the tentacle i mean i mean i love day of the tentacle but i read the design documents there wasn't a lot of gameplay there for me i the puzzles um and Secret of Monkey Island is a brilliant game, minus the chicken with the pulley in the middle, which is completely unfair in the text version of it. Um, you people who played with the icon that actually showed the chicken with a pulley in the middle of it had a huge advantage over me. So I was mm. like, examine chicken. It has a pulley. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I first played it, it was just text. There was, <clears> they didn't have the icon things, you know. But insult sword fighting is just a brilliant piece of conceptual design. Uh, uh, fantastic. Um, love it. So yes, was already a big fan of Monkey Island when we did Curse. Mm. So yeah, was it was it um, was that some pressure kind of taking that on? No, because it had been a long time since Monkey 2. Like Monkey 2 came out in 91, I think, and we were coming out in 97. Um, and it was going to be so very, very different. Little tiny pixel characters, um, you know, 16 verbs at the bottom of the screen or something like that. It was um, <laughs> a lot more colors to play with, uh, a lot more pixels, um, better tools. Um, by this time, we had gotten improved tools from, from Ron, so we were no longer using Bile. We were using something called Cisc, which was way better. Um, so uh, Eric had improved the interpreter so we could use colors more efficiently. Um, you know, we had full digital sounds. So it was going to have voice. We would stolen Vince Lee's video player from uh, the Insane Engine. So we were going to do full scene cinematics. Um, so, uh, you know, technically, and at, at, by the time Larry and I had moved on to Curse, I think we'd both done four major adventure games in between. So we knew how to make them. Um, but we also knew that we had to do a good job because we didn't want to 
do a slapdash version of a Monkey Island game or uh, a pastiche that was just echoing stuff from the old game. Mm. Mm. Um, I know after that, I I know you um, you, jo you joined Disney doing attractions. It also s says that you worked for, um, for Lego for a brief time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Lego. Yeah, me too. Um, what was that? What was that doing? Was that the um, you know the programmable thingies? Yeah, it was Lego Mindstorms. Mm -hmm. So they had opened up an office in Nevada, which was also in Marin County, where I was. And um, it's the toy robot division. So um, as as you probably know, they have their uh, shoot. I always forget this this version. It's uh, it's Mindstorms, but without the motors. Um, well, in any case, it's the kind that you can actually build functioning working machines out of. You can build like a Ferrari with a oh, like Technic Lego Technic or. Yes, Lego Technics, yeah. right? So it's Lego Technics, but with a programmable uh, logic controller and a whole bunch of outputs and inputs. So you can build working robots. And so for a couple of years, worked on a couple of really fun projects, which is the Robotic Invention System 2.0. And I could really get wonky about all the technical improvements we made over 1.0 and 1.5. We had true variables, how do you know? Because, um, you know, everybody's excited about that. Yeah. We, had, we had nested branches, nested loops. It was kick-ass. And then we also, in that time period, shipped something called Lego Vision Command, which uh, hooked up a camera to your robot. And this doesn't seem like much today, like all of the stuff that's like your computer can do standing on its head was really difficult at the time. So uh, the um, Lego vision command was a little ahead of its time in that wireless technology wasn't really there for cameras. So you couldn't like have a unwired camera and send the video back to your computer. So you had to build a robot that would have to run around on the floor with a three meter cable dragged behind it. Um, but it still did some amazing things and, you know, could recognize movement or color and, uh, and interact with stuff. Wow. Really, it, it was a great toy and a great company. Mm. That's cool. I know they still use some of that stuff that the, the, the things that like sensors that recognize color and this, that, and you can set it up to do clever things. It's, that's awesome. Um, so you went on to do um, like in, interactive attractions, I suppose. Would that be the term at, at Disney? Yep. Um, so I guess, you know, the backbone of the Lucas, LucasArts Adventure Games was, was storytelling, really. Um, mm -hmm interactive storytelling so did that kind of help you with designing the attractions for disney that that background in interactive storytelling at lucasarts absolutely um i mean if you so the the first attraction that that i conceived which actually wasn't the first one that made it into the field it was called the kim possible world showcase adventure and it started off as a a play test um it eventually turned into a complete attraction, which is still running today. It just became the DuckTales World Showcase Adventure. So it's now 14 years later and it's still still around, which is kind of unheard of for an interactive attraction. But if you look at the structure of um, each of those missions, it's very much the, you know, it's very much stolen from Ron Gilbert, right? You, you have your, your global arc, and you have your three or four subtasks in between, which you can do in any order. And then once those are done, then you know you can move on and complete the node and then go do the next one. So it is very classically an adventure game. Uh, over time, um, you know, we tried some different things. There's an attraction called Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom, which was also very successful. Uh, and that's that's more a true RPG. Um, but we were definitely applying tried and true um, game mechanics to installations in the real world for what we were doing there. 
was that cool did you get to see people kind of um enjoying that those live you know it was amazing and it's something that you don't really get with video games maybe you do now if you watch people on twitch but back in the day all you got in terms of feedback for your games were what the reviewers said about it and then occasionally if you went on like a bulletin board and you really wanted to feel bad about yourself you could see what people were posting on the internet um but seeing people play your game live in person is an amazing experience and i'm very grateful for it when we were play testing the kim possible world just showcase experience we were in the japan pavilion and one of the effects so in the game you have your your communicator which is a cell phone and it, and the characters on the the cell phone would tell you where to go and what you to do and then using that cell phone you would press a button and it would trigger some crazy mad invention like a weather machine that makes it rain and lightning inside a building or brings a uh, a toy soldier to life will talk to you and give you the next clue all sorts of fun stuff so we were in the japan pavilion the, the japan um, area of epcot and a little girl was running around playing the experience and she ran over to the koi pond and as part of the mission you have to press the button when you're near the koi pond and it causes a waterfall to rain down and cascade into the koi pond and so this little girl ran up, she pressed the button, magical music played, the waterfall came down, and she was literally jumping up and down and running up to strangers and yelling, I did it, I did it, I did it. And she was so proud and I, I cried. I, I honestly had to like walk off stage because it was so amazing. The feeling that I made that little girl happy and she's having a magical day. I still get ch choked up over it. So yeah. Um, being able to see people play and enjoy your games in real life is a real, it's a treasure. That's great. That's great. Does, does it surprise you that things like um, going, going back to the, the gaming side, does it surpri surprise you that things like, you know, uh, Bear the Tentacle and Monkey Island are still so popular and talked about 30 years later? Yes. Uh, especially Curse of Monkey Island, because we did not do a Macintosh version for Curse. And that was an unfortunate thing. The reason it's unfortunate is like beyond Windows 95, when they revised the games and re-released them, they re-released the Macintosh versions of them. And so unlike I'm sure when you talk to Aaron Giles, he's the guy who, who wrote that Macintosh version. All the other scum games got new versions that could play on modern machines, but Curse could not. And I thought, well, nobody's ever going to play Curse, this, you know, who keeps around your Windows 95 machine. And I thought, well, that's, that's sad. I was a little depressed about that. And then... But there are insane, crazed geniuses around the world who are like, I'm going to reverse engineer the scum interpreter somehow. <laughs> I still don't know how they do it. Uh, and they went through and they just poked things. And, oh, if I poke that, this happens over here. And they created their own interpreter for Curse of Monkey Island and kind of resurrected this program that no one had been able to play for a while. So um, I will always be grateful for that. And, and I'm also just like, I have no idea how you do that. How in the world would you rebuild a dead program with no documentation? And people are really smart. So, uh, so and then yes, just to think that 30 years later, a game that is still being run on an emulator that was written by fans um, and gets re-released. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that, that people remember it and remember it fondly mm. or are still playing it today. Um, and yeah, I think that that's all my questions. 
do you want to tell us what you're up to now and anything you want to plug for anyone who does watch eventually? Uh, I'm doing fun, cool stuff, but it's nothing that I can plug right now. Okay. Uh, I did write a book. Um, it's called uh, Off by One Serious Games, available on Amazon.com if you're interested. Uh, and it's uh, uh, set in the game development world of 1993, but it very quickly devolves into a, a, a crime spy thriller. So you can get your, your uh, classic adventure game development fix behind the scenes look uh, and then you know and and then you're trying to save the world from terrible villains so awesome do set do send me a link to that because i'm, I'm going to buy that and also i'll i'll uh, i'll send everybody else over over that way that sounds cool. uh, it does sound interesting thank um, you. but yeah i realize your time is very precious i thank you so much for uh for giving some up for me today i really appreciate it Happy to do it and glad the people remember Day of the Tentacle.